All right, everyone. So it's um, 6 p.m. Uh, we've got a lot to cover today. So uh, first of all, good evening. Um, I'm Susan Grasso, and I work in the Complete Streets program at Locomotion with my colleague, Jonathan Weber, who manages our program here. We'll be your hosts and speakers for tonight's presentation. First of all, thank you for being here tonight. We're really excited for this Learning Network event, and we think you'll find it super interesting. So a few housekeeping details before we get started. I've muted everyone for the presentation part of this meeting. We have a lot to cover, but we'll have time at the end for discussion. Feel free to put quest questions and comments in the chat whenever they come to you. And at the end of the presentation, you can also raise your hand during the Q&A. If you have any technical issues, you can post them in the chat box or contact us at either susan at locomotion.org or jonathan at locomotion.org. So this webinar is being recorded and we will share the recording with you in the next few days, along with some resources related to tonight's presentation. So now let's get started. This evening, we will present what's a walk, bike and roll master plan and why your town needs one. This is the second in our learning event series, which is intended to give you as a walk, bike and roll advocate, the knowledge and tools you need to make change in your community. So I'm gonna start with uh, Locomotion's mission, which is to make it safe, accessible, and fun for everyone to bike, walk, and roll in Vermont. Of course, we have limited staff, and in order to succeed in our mission, we need Vermonters like you working to make change in your community. One of the ways we support you is through educational resources like this presentation tonight. We have three more planned for the coming months. Uh, Jonathan will post a link to those in the chat when he has a chance. Um, this winter series takes the knowledge that our staff has and distills it down to the most essential things for you to know and be successful. So we have some learning goals for tonight. Um, we're hoping you uh, leave this webinar with an understanding of the different types and benefits of walk bike plans, the importance of creating all ages and abilities networks and especially your role as local advocates in the bike ped planning process. So the first half of this webinar will be used to help frame your role in active transportation planning. It will focus on what, as advocates, we're all trying to accomplish in the big picture sense, and also how projects in a community actually move from conception to completion. And then in the second half, we'll dig into some specific ways in which you can move bike and pedestrian planning forward in your own communities. So to lead us through part one of this webinar, I'm gonna turn things over to Jonathan. All right, excellent. Thanks, Susan, and welcome everybody. So first, some, some quick review of our last webinar. <clears throat> um, we gave an overview of just generally how to make your place better for walking and biking. So we talked a lot about both land use and transportation. We talked about the traditional urban form, which is characterized by dense development and mixed use housing and commercial areas. And this traditional urban form has existed for thousands of years, and it generally makes for very walkable and bikeable places. Around the time of the Great Depression, uh, North America began what's thought of now as the suburban experiment, which is really characterized by low density development, uh, and networks of streets, roads, and strodes that are built around moving cars fast and then devoting large areas uh, devote to parking those cars. So the suburban experiment, generally speaking, created places that are not very walkable or bikeable. So both the traditional development pattern and the suburban experiment can be thought of as feedback loops. The suburban experiment generates a vicious cycle shown here in red, where cars offer the opportunity for people to choose to live further from destinations, uh, which increases traffic and creates demand for parking. And then when traffic gets bad, uh, and when they feel like there isn't enough parking, communities often respond by adding more lanes and building more parking to accommodate that demand. But of course, as soon as they do that, build those lanes and add that parking, uh, we've made it easier to drive we again, therefore, make driving more appealing and more people make the choice to live further away from destinations. We get more sprawling development and walking, biking, or taking the bus become less appealing. 
So our work as advocates is really to interrupt and unwind this, the sort of the red uh, vicious cycle and accelerate uh, the virtuous cycle shown in this graphic in green. So I'm gonna start at the point in the virtuous cycle, which basically describes our advocacy work, which is in the upper right corner. Uh, when we can devote more space to walking and biking, we make those urban walkable places more appealing and we can actually create more of them since we don't have to devote, devote as much place to parking, we can have more housing, uh, more commercial uses near that housing. And this all creates demand for and allows people to live closer to their work and destination. For those people now able to live closer to where they need to go, uh, walking, biking, and transit become more convenient. And as more people use those modes, uh, the demand for space for cars, whether that's parking or lanes, is reduced. And this creates more physical space as well as more political will for investment into walking, biking, and transit. So you can sort of see how this cycle uh, builds on and reinforces itself. The work of reversing these damaging social impacts of the suburban experiment is also experimental, right? The, the thing that North American did, the, the thing that North America did, the way that we've built is not something that any uh, culture has ever done. And so there's not a lot of precedent for how to unwind it. So we really should approach our work with both enthusiasm and urgency, uh, but also some humility knowing that uh, we're doing things that there is not a lot of precedent for. Along with having land use that puts people within biking and walking distance of their destinations, improving infrastructure is the key uh, especially when it comes to getting more people to bike. Infrastructure is also, also very important to walking and rolling. Um, but for those modes, you know, as long as there's a sidewalk and safe crossings uh, and the destinations are close enough to where people live uh, or there is transit to act as an accelerator to get those people closer to where they need to go, as long as those things are in place, you know, walking infrastructure is relatively straightforward. Biking infrastructure is a little more complicated. So this is a graphic of the three types of potential bicyclists. And the idea here, which is based on multiple studies, is that somewhere around 70% of all people, so the general population, not just people who currently ride bikes, but 70% of the general population uh, is potentially willing to bike for transportation. And within that 70%, there are three groups. Uh, and this graphic shows them divided up uh, based on the level of traffic stress they're willing to experience. Level of traffic stress is a quantitative measure of how stressful riding on any given street is. It usually uses a four level rating system with LTS four representing the highest stress and LTS one representing the lowest stress. Uh, LTS uses various factors like the type of bike infrastructure available, the number of travel lanes, uh, the speed of cars, how many cars there are, so what the traffic volume is, as well as the presence of parking lanes. So on the left uh, is the experienced and confident rider. This is someone who will ride just about anywhere, regardless of what the infrastructure for biking might look like. So you might see this rider on the shoulder of a state highway, uh, and only about 1% of the general population is this kind of rider. Uh, this rider, you know, they might be even sharing a lane with cars, as you see in the graphic here all the way on the left. Um, and again, this is a very small percentage of the population typically about 1%. Second from the left uh, is, the, is the casual and somewhat confident rider. And many people here tonight are likely uh, this type of rider. And painted bike infrastructure might be enough for us on certain streets. And we're willing to endure some kind of scary feeling situations as long as our rides are mostly uh, okay. The infrastructure in a lot of Vermont's traditional towns and villages might be sufficient uh, to make this type of rider feel comfortable, but uh, we'd still really like better, more comfortable infrastructure, and we'd like it to be in more places. But this group is still only about 7% of the general population. I count myself among this group. I think a lot of current uh, bike advocates likely do as well. The vast majority of the general public are what we call the interested but concerned and they're shown on the right. So these folks generally require LTS2 or LTS1 infrastructure, and that typically looks like a separated bike path or a well-protected bike lane. 
And these folks are only comfortable sharing the street with cars when speeds are below 20 miles per hour. So the key in getting more people out biking in particular is to build that level of traffic stress one and two infrastructure that is comfortable enough for that big 60% uh, of the population, those interested but concerned riders. Doing this is also really key to ensuring that our funding and our capacity to build infrastructure is used equitably in a way that most people are gonna benefit from. Uh, I really encourage you to check out our webinar on level of traffic stress, and we'll put a link to that in the chat. So let's look at uh, Winooski as an example, which is in the process of creating a vision for a bike network. This map shows the level of traffic stress associated with uh, Winooski streets. So the green and the yellow represent the lower stress segments that approximately that 60% of people would feel comfortable using. While the red uh, and the yellow represent the higher stress segments where really less than 10% of the public feel safe. There is a lot of green and yellow on the map, but if you look closely, you'll see how the red high stress corridors uh, like Main Street, La Fountain, and Spring Street and Mouth Bay Avenue, they tend to isolate uh, the big chunks of neighborhood streets from being able to access all parts of the city. These high stress corridors tend to be our main arterials, uh, which also provide the most direct ways to access destinations. It's also often the case that our lowest stress segments, which are often neighborhood streets, especially in this example, uh, take people riding bikes on less direct, longer routes, and oftentimes uh, they have dead ends. Uh, Winooski Public School Complex, for example, is shown here in the pink X. And Winooski as a whole is only about a mile or so in diameter. It's a very bikeable distance. Uh, but the school is really isolated from much of the community because of these high stress roads. So the point about talking, uh, the point in talking about level of traffic stress and bicycle networks is to give you a framework for thinking about your community's bike system uh, relative to its street network. So where should your bike network go and who should it be designed for? And of course, there's a trade off here, which is that Low stress infrastructure is often expensive and takes longer to build, while higher stress infrastructure is less expensive and usually can be installed more quickly. For example, building a shared use path along a busy street is much more expensive than striping a bike lane on that street. So as a local advocate, you'll have to consider whether building more expensive low stress infrastructure is the right thing, even if it takes more time and money, or if your community would be better off widening shoulders or striping conventional bike lanes even if they only appeal to a smaller part of the population. It may also be that the high stress infrastructure is a stepping stone to generate the support and resources needed for your community to build the lower stress infrastructure. So here's an example from Shelburne, which recently faced this exact tension. Uh, Shelburne was trying to figure out how to improve the westernmost segment of Bay Road for people walking and biking. Uh, this road leads to popular local and tourist destination, which is Shelburne Farms. The initial plan here was to widen shoulders, but this was eventually scrapped uh, in favor of extending a nearby shared use off-road path. While several factors played into Shelburne's decision, one of them was the idea that an off-road shared use path would be accessible to a wider range of people, again, getting at that 60% interested but concerned. So Shelburne is currently moving forward with a grant to explore the feasibility of a shared use path in this area. So in this case, the community decided that it was better to wait and go through the process to build the more expensive, lower stress infrastructure. Um, you, there might be a different decision made in a different context, but it's important to think about where you are, think about uh, who you are building the infrastructure for, and therefore what it needs to look like. I want to end this portion of the slideshow with a quick overview of how infrastructure projects actually get built in communities. And all new projects will go through this general process. Note that we're not talking about maintenance or replacement projects here, so this doesn't really apply to, for example, replacing a stretch of sidewalk. But for new projects, uh, these can be initiated you know, at the town administrative level, uh, so from your town staff, or ideas can come from the public, such as projects that advocates push for in their communities. For major road projects, 
Uh, public feedback can help shape a project's design and provide the public support that's going to be necessary for investment. As an advocate, your role in this ideation stage, the first stage, is really to, you know, move a project forward. So you, you have an idea for a project, you think it should get done, or maybe the project is listed somewhere in your town plan, and you want to see it move forward. It's sort of your role as an advocate to get the ball rolling by talking to your town staff and talking to your elected folks. The second step is a uh, study. And all new infrastructure projects have to be assessed for feasibility in some way. Sometimes this is as simple as your town highway department or your public works department uh, taking a look and coming up with a little, a really simple plan, maybe working with some other town staff. Other times uh, this requires, you know, a more comprehensive scoping study. If the project is large and you're going to be using state grants, which typically use federal dollars, then you will have to do a scoping study as a requirement as part of that funding. The role for an advocate in, uh, in the study process is really to engage, make sure the recommendations that the study is coming up with are going to meet your community's needs and also make for good infrastructure for walking and biking. Less complicated projects uh, like lane narrowing, bike lanes, or painted sidewalks can sometimes be implemented based on conceptual designs. But if it's a more significant project, you're going to have to go into the, a more detailed engineering and design phase. As an advocate, when the project is being engineered and designed uh, before it goes to construction, it's a great idea to try and get the plans, have a look at them, make sure that they match and achieve uh, what's in the study, make sure that the design looks like it's going to be safe for walking and biking. And uh, if you're in Vermont, you can absolutely reach out to us at Local Motion for help reviewing those engineering plans. The final step is for the project to really be built. And uh, the role for advocates here is to monitor the project if you have the time. So you can go out and, and check out what's being built. And if it looks like it's, it's gonna result in what's in the plan and in the engineering design. Um, but really the more important role is probably after the thing is built to make sure that your town is maintaining it, whether that's sweeping it or plowing it or uh, patching the asphalt make sure that your town is actually taking care of what they've just built. So this is the general way that infrastructure projects from the smallest to the largest get done, uh, whether they're just sort of an ad hoc project or part of a holistic plan. And we're gonna to refer to these stages later in the webinar. So just a quick recap of this first section of the presentation. We talked about uh, level of traffic stress and how that relates to uh, different different segments of the general population and how lower stress infrastructure, LTS one and two, is more likely to get more people out biking. And we talked about how projects go from idea to implementation. We talked a lot about uh, how you can advocate for such a network in your community throughout the, the project development phases. And that ideation stage is really a key one to think about, you know, where do these projects come from? And oftentimes local groups identify projects based on just ideas that they have. And this can be a good way to go about it because you probably have a really deep understanding of your community's bike and pedestrian needs. But this approach also has some, some pitfalls, right? It, it doesn't lend itself really well to thinking about the whole network in a cohesive way. Um, it's, it's not a, usually a sanctioned process that your whole town is going through that feels democratic, where it feels like the, the whole community is gonna be invested and supported in it. So a walk-bike plan can help you avoid these situations. And that's exactly what Susan is gonna tell you all about. Great, thanks, Jonathan. So um, so yeah, a, a walk-bike plan is like a roadmap that uh, can help your community know what it needs to do to achieve their goals related to active transportation. It'll also help your walk-bike group know what you should be working on. So in this part of the webinar, we're gonna talk about some specific strategies that you can use to begin to build or create a local walk bike plan. I wanna emphasize uh, before we get started that bike ped plans can begin very simply and build over time to develop a whole town strategy. So a simple first step uh, is for, for you to conduct a community survey. This is something that local walk bike advocates can do on their own. It's also something, again, if you're in Vermont, I notice we have a lot of folks uh, from out of state, but if you're in Vermont, that's something that Locomotion can help you plan and administer. 
Community surveys can be really useful in beginning to understand your community's active transportation related behaviors, concerns, and desires. They can help you learn about the barriers residents face when walking and biking, and also get a sense of the level of support in your community for investing in improvements. This slide shows some results from a survey that Locomotion helped advocates in Randolph conduct. From it, their local ad advocates identified areas in their community that residents wanted to see improved. This can help you choose some initial projects that are likely to be supported by your community. Community surveys also make people aware of your advocacy work and can help you develop good working relationships with elected and town officials. So another way that advocates can begin to understand the needs in their community is through walk audits. The walk audit, which often includes biking as well, is a tool that you can use to evaluate the safety and comfort of a single street, intersection, or even small neighborhood. There are many existing walk audit forms or templates that you can use or adapt for your own purposes. The one shown here is from AARP. Again, this is an evaluation that you can conduct yourself or you can organize for others in your town to complete. Uh, again, you can get help from us here at Locomotion and sometimes from local offices of the Vermont Department of Health. So you can take the results of a walk bike audit to your local decision makers and ask them to take action to improve identified areas of concern. So surveys and audits are great tools for understanding problem areas in your community but they're not the best option for determining how to fix them. Walk bike action plans are a more involved effort that both identify problems and recommend solutions for smaller sections of your town. They require fewer resources than when planning for an entire community. So they're a great way for towns that are beginning this work to begin to build townwide awareness and support for an eventual townwide plan. School travel plans are a type of action plan that focus on the connection between home and school. They often include strategies in addition to infrastructure improvements to help change behavior and make walking and biking an everyday way to get to school. For example, they can include safety education programming or events to encourage walking and biking. School travel plans are also great because they make sure that a safe routes to school program maintains momentum uh, in case uh, a volunteer or staff turnover. So this example shown here in the slide is from Bristol, which focused on the connections between their elementary and high schools. So uh, this might be something your group could do depending on the level of expertise available. Uh, and again, you could also reach out to us here at Locomotion for help, or even for a perspective on whether an action plan would be a good fit for your community. So this next slide shows an official map from Heinsberg. Official maps are lesser known, but powerful tools that communities can use for creating walk, bike, infrastructure connections. In active transportation planning, we often encounter the problem of being able to show desired future bike ped connectivity if those connections exist on private property. The official map, which is authorized in Vermont state statute, allows towns to show future municipal infrastructure like roads or paths, even if they're located on private property. Having these connections identified on your town's official map gives the town leverage in development discussions to ensure that these connections are made. And it also gives communities the opportunity to acquire land or rights of way that have been identified for public improvement. So you could bring this idea up with your town leaders and consider the option to develop an official map if your town doesn't already have one. In this slide, uh, we'll talk about the town comprehensive plan. These are high level documents that set direction for your town and its staff. Not all towns have comprehensive plans, but if they do, they must contain a transportation section. Comprehensive plans get updated about every eight years and each update is an opportunity to set your town in a more bike walk and roll friendly direction. You might, for example, suggest a goal around increasing rates of walking and biking in your town with creating a walk bike master plan as a recommended action, which would set the direction for your town staff to develop a master plan, which we'll talk about next. 
but having this uh, document would give you um, uh, an official town resource that you could use to act as an advocacy tool. So at this point, I've gone over some of the more, what we would call resource light uh, planning strategies you can consider for developing your all ages and abilities walk bike network. These are low to no cost actions that you can either lead on your own or ask your town to support. The next approach I'm gonna talk about is the walk bike master plan. The walk bike master plan is considered the gold standard for active transportation planning. They provide the best opportunity to help your community learn about and understand the importance of an all ages and abilities network, and they provide your town with a game plan on how to build one. Walk bike master plans are time consuming and costly to develop. They typically take about a year or so to complete, and the cost for developing one can start at around $50,000 and go up from there, depending on how comprehensive they are. So because of the work that they require, towns will typically hire an external consultant, or sometimes they can work with their regional planning commission to create these plans. There are funding resources available, and we'll be talking about those in some detail at our February webinar, so be sure to check that out. So um, what goes into a walk bike master plan? I've listed some important content here, including um, efforts uh, made to engage the community, a description of transportation-related existing conditions, um, identification of your town's values and goals, a list of prioritized projects, policies, and programs, how your plan will coordinate with other plans in your town, um, a section uh, that describes ideas about what your facilities should look like, um, another section that explains how your master plan will be implemented, and then some discussion about what performance met metric data you might use to help you know if your plan is achieving uh, its goals. So not all plans will include all of these elements, but the best ones will. Um, I'm gonna, uh, in the next few slides, discuss some of these sections in more detail, but I just wanna stress upfront that while you as local advocates won't lead the creation of the Walk Bike Master Plan, you play an extremely important part in making sure that your town's plan is done as well as possible. So I'll include some ideas about how you can do that uh, also in the next few slides. So the first section I wanna talk about is community outreach. Community outreach should happen throughout the course of the plan's development. It's really important part of the process. First, because the plan should show how it responds to the needs and desires of residents. So it needs to know what those are. Also, the final plan will be su submitted to your town select board or council for adoption. So the plan will need the support um, of the community. There are a number of different ways um, towns can go about engaging with their communities and you're likely familiar with most of them. The project team could hold traditional public meetings or local listening sessions. It's also a really good idea to go and meet people where they are such as at farmers markets or community centers or um, housing complexes. Um, uh, you can also you know, conduct those community surveys or deploy online uh, mapping tools. It uh, can be a great way to get information from the public as well as conducting um, a local walk bike audits. So an important thing to think about when you're providing input to your consultant's community engagement plan is to consider how diverse voices will be represented in the plan. You'll wanna make sure that you're hearing from folks that fall into that interested but concerned category that Jonathan talked about. And you'll also wanna make sure that the planning team hears from those groups that have been traditionally underrepresented in transportation planning, like people of color, people having less income, people that are very young or very old, um, and other groups, you'll, you'll just wanna make sure that you get broad um, uh, representation um, uh, into the plan. So this is something that you uh, as a local advocate can probably help with, um, with your deep connections within your communities.
So to create a plan for your future network, your walk bike master plan first needs to understand the current state of your community. So it should include a section that answers questions like, how do people get around today? What are their barriers? It might include things like your existing network along with a level of traffic stress analysis, um, maybe commuting to work or travel to school or other travel behaviors. Um, it could include crash data um, that reveals the more unsafe areas of your town. Uh, it could also include like traffic volume and speed data for some of the more important or major corridors in your town. It could also include information about population demographics, um, expected uh, growth uh, patterns in your community. Um, and it will also likely inc include previous studies or plans that may have been done in different parts of your town. So all of this kind of information will be useful in planning your future active transportation network. So uh, walk bike master plans should also paint a picture of the value of the plan to the community and should make it clear what communities are hoping to achieve with their walk, bike, and roll network. This is often an overlooked section of bike and pedestrian planning and sometimes difficult to get a handle on. For example, we all want a safe, connected network that makes it easy for people to go to the places they want to go. But that, without knowing your community's preferences, it's hard to figure out how to prioritize the many projects needed to realize that big vision. So there are different ways to approach this question. And one way to think about it, as I've shown here in this slide, is in terms of who are we building for and for what purpose? Regarding the who, we've already talked about the different types of people riding bikes that exist and how infrastructure design will determine which people are likely to use the infrastructure we build. We can also think about the who using an equity lens to think about the needs of different socio-demographic groups in our towns, like those less mobile or those who don't have access to a car or uh, people carrying groceries or traveling with kids or pets um, and so on. So regarding the purposes, I've listed some common ones on the right side of the slide for you to consider. South Burlington, for example, has identified climate action as a prime community value and has set a goal to reduce vehicle miles traveled by 2.5% annually in support of that value. Winooski, on the other hand, calls itself the Opportunity City and identifies as a place that strives to incorporate equity consider considerations in all of its work. So it can be beneficial to understand what your community cares about and then build the walk bike plan around this interest so that residents can see a clear connection between the investment they're making and the common good the plan is intending to bring about in their community. So here's an example from Burlington's uh, master walk bike plan. They tied their plan recommendations to two primary objectives, uh, the first, to eliminate traffic-related fatalities and serious injuries, and the second, to make walking and biking a viable and enjoyable way to get around town. Um, so um, all master plans will include a list of bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure projects that your town believes to be important. These will be determined from public and municipal input previous studies, and consultant recommendations. I've shown here that the plan could also include related supporting projects that make walking, biking, or taking the bus more on par with driving, like adding desirable amenities of bus stops or a potential park and ride lot. These are less commonly seen in master walk bike plans, but if your town has identified the desire for a truly multimodal system, then you might consider including projects like these. The plan could also support um, or include support for the practice of conducting demonstration projects and quick build infrastructure. So if you're not familiar with those terms, demonstration projects are temporary projects that allow a community to test a type of infrastructure that may be new to them before investing in a permanent design. They're typically installed and uh, and in place on the order of days or weeks. 
This slide shows a temporary painted rainbow bump out that Locomotion installed in Lindenville last summer. You can see how it creates a much shorter and more comfortable pedestrian experience when crossing Main Street using just temporary paint and flexible posts. This bump out also notice, noticeably calmed traffic while it was in place. So um, demonstrations are a great way to begin to figure out what type of infrastructure will work best in a given location and to build public support for it. And it can be helpful to have the plan recognize and support the value of having demonstration projects. Demonstration projects can also be used as a form of community engagement during development of a plan or during um, a scoping feasibility study. So a quick build infrastructure project falls between the demonstration project and long-term permanent infrastructure. They're intended to be long lasting, but they're constructed using lower cost materials in less hardened ways than fully engineered infrastructure. This allows them to be built on the order of days, weeks, or months, not years, as is too often the case with more robust and permanent facilities. So um, quick builds are designed to be easily tweaked or even removed if necessary. And that gives communities um, much needed flexibility they can be made more permanent over time by replacing lighter weight materials with more durable, longer lasting ones. So for example, you could convert that demonstration prod bump out uh, like the one we tested in Lindenville with a quick build. The image on the slide shows a quick build bump out example from the corner of Main Street and South Champlain Street in Burlington. So it's been made more permanent than the demonstration example by using longer lasting paint and sturdier bollards and planters. So to really change the culture of our transportation system from an auto-centric one to one that favors more walking and biking, we need to do more than build good infrastructure. So your plan could consider policies and programs that can help build and normalize walking and biking um, and include those as well. So this slide shows some examples. Um, so for example, a bike parking ordinance can create bike parking as development normally occurs in a community. For many people, having bike parking available can be the difference between a choice to make a trip by bike or by car. Car parking ordinances are another example. They can be changed to limit the amount of parking that's required during development. This both frees up valuable real estate for more productive uses and can help put the choice to bike or drive on a more level playing field. Communities can also identify programming in their plan to provide things like bike safety education, how-to information, uh, group experiences. These types of programs can help build the knowledge, confidence, and skills that are needed by less experienced riders. So these types of programs also help build your community's walk bike culture which is helpful in terms of generating political will for new investment. But good infrastructure is really the key to walkable and bikeable communities. A common question we get asked is how to prioritize a list of projects that have been identified as critical for the de desired walk-bike network. This is where all of the early work to understand your community's values and goals pays off. The prioritization approach should align with your community's values and goals. For example, if your community goal is for every child within walking or biking distance to safely walk or bike to school, then the prioritization model could assess projects according to whether they're located along a route to school, and then possibly according to the number of homes served by those routes. From this list, projects could be selected for priority implementation based on project costs or funding opportunity or uh, feasibility, for example, if property needed to be developed. So as an advocate, your role here is to make sure that the prioritization approach ties back to the values and goals your community has identified and to make sure that the resulting prioritization makes sense to you. So another really important part of a walk-bike master plan, maybe the most important, 
is the implementation section. The section tells the community what it actually needs to do to make plan recommendations a reality. Um, important elements in the implementation section include um, some idea of the project's cost, at least at a planning level of high, medium, or low. And where it makes sense, it could also identify the party responsible for moving the item forward. For example, if your school has embraced the idea of supporting a Safe Routes to School program as part of your master planning effort, then you could document that in the plan. If your local trail club has agreed to take on the task of maintaining primitive paths, then you could add that to your plan as well. So this just helps to build in responsibility and accountability for the plan. The implementation section should also include some idea of whether the action is intended to be done in the near, medium, or distant future. Projects could even be planned so that they include quick build infrastructure in the immediate future that transitions to more uh, robust infrastructure over time. And then lastly, it's also a good idea to include the development stage of your project, which Jonathan talked about earlier in the presentation. Is the project in that ideation conceptualization phase or in the feasibility study phase or the design phase or construction phase? This will help you really be ready and prepared for grant or other opportunities that come up. So knowing the project stage can also help your advocacy group create their annual work plan. For example, one project might need some vetting with local landowners, while a second might be ready for a scoping study grant and a third ready for construction using town resources. So I wanna emphasize here that the implementation section is a really important advocacy tool for you to use to help you track progress and keep your town on course. It's often very helpful for you to make your own spreadsheet with the impl implementation section that you can then use to track the status of projects. So um, lastly, just a few comments about metrics. Performance metrics close a loop between a community's vision and its approach for making that vision a reality, the implementation plan. Metrics can help you assess whether your plan is working. If you have the data, you can identify a baseline value and then set a target for improvement. So it can be tricky to identify good metrics because good data is hard to find and uh, most communities don't have the capacity to do much data collecting on their own. So we recommend that you keep things really simple and look for readily available data like crash rates, which VTrans makes publicly available or infrastructure mileage, which your town will track. But at the same time, you wanna make sure that the data you decide to use is actually a good measure of what you're trying to accomplish. So miles of bike lanes might not be as good a measure as miles of low stress LTS one and two bike infrastructure that connects destinations of, import, of importance. So here's an example from the Burlington, um, their master plan. It shows uh, baseline transportation mode share distribution for 2000 and 2013 on the left, using data obtained from the federal census, which is um, also easily obtainable. And then the graphic on the right shows the target mode share distribution for 2026. For biking, for example, the percentage of people biking to work was 1.2% in 2000. Uh, it grew to 5.7% in 2013. And Burlington set a target goal of 12% in 2026. So some advocates might think that once the plan is finished, their work is done. But uh, unfortunately, the opposite is usually true. Uh, so your role as an advocate is first to ensure the plan is adopted by your town leaders. And then you should also make sure that your municipal staff and boards are familiar with the plan's content so that they can incorporate it into their work. But most importantly, you'll likely continue to have to advocate for the implementation of the projects, programs, and policies in your plan so that your plan doesn't sit on a shelf and collect dust. But now uh, you'll have a community vetted and publicly supported document that you can lean on to get that local, state, and federal investment into your projects. And in many cases, having such a plan 
will be required or at least give you a leg up on grant applications. So I wanna end by emphasizing that your role as an advocate is really to shepherd walk, bike and roll planning at whatever make, stage makes sense in your community. And uh, also, you know, build public political will to take the next step to implement projects and policies. So I hope this presentation has given you some ideas about how you might approach this work in your community. And again, I wanna remind everyone that there is technical assistance available from your regional planning commissions or from us here at Locomotion um, to help you get started. So please feel free to reach out. So I'm gonna leave off with this slide, which shows the remaining webinars we'll be hosting in our winter series for advocates. The February funding webinar will pick up where this one leaves off and talk about sources of funding for your planning and infrastructure projects. Um, and we've also included a link to the webinar series in our chat. So thanks for listening, everyone. Um, I'd like to now open it up for conversation and hear from you. All right, we've got a got quite a few questions. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Let's let's go to uh, let's hear from an attendee first. We've got Rick Sharp with his hand up. So Rick, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. And uh, Rick, while you're asking your question and I'm answering, I think Susan will check the the chat and the Q and A, and we'll get to those as well. So Rick, you should uh, should be able to unmute now. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I thought that was a great presentation. Uh, very well done. And I'm glad that you're uh, doing this series. I think it's exactly what we need in Vermont uh, today to bring the success that we've had in Burlington to the rest of the state. And um, I would encourage people to think big when they have these plans and to think um, what is the most important part of their community and how can they get a bike path along that most important part, okay? So for Burlington, Vermont, that was along the lakeshore and the old railroad runaway and all the way out to the the, the islands. For a place like um, uh, Bellows Falls, Vermont, uh, the uh, Connecticut River to me is the most important thing and that's where you ought to be talking about getting a separated path installed. So I hope that uh, all the communities, all the people that are listening to you here tonight um, will take to heart what has happened in Burlington over the last 40 years. And it is not impossible for that to happen in your community. You just have to identify the goals that you want and you have to pursue them until they occur. So along those lines, I also want to comment that this is the 25th year of locomotion, the anniversary of locomotion. It's also the August will be the 20th year of the dedication of the bridge across the Winooski River that allowed the island uh, line trail that we use today um, to come into existence. Um, and it's also, of course, the founding of locomotion. So I would propose that we have a big celebration sometime in late August to celebrate all uh, accomplishments here. I've already talked with Howard Dean about it. He's willing to attend. Um, I've talked with Brian Costello as well. Chapin Spencer um, and uh, Tom Hutspeth, I think, would all be great candidates for gathering there to um, take a look at what we've accomplished over the last 25 years and then think about what we want to do for the next 25 years. Thank you very all much. Right. Great. Thanks, Rick. And yeah, I appreciate all the uh, all the words of wisdom and encouragement there, especially for the other communities outside of the state. Um, and, and I think Rick made, made a good point, especially in terms of thinking about, you know, what projects are going to motivate people in your community and get more people interested and engaged in walking and biking. So that's another factor to think about as an advocate when you consider uh, where your town should put its limited resources, what projects it should prioritize, what's, what's going to get more people engaged. So folks, if you want to voice a question, feel free to raise your hand. We've got a lot of folks posting questions in the chat. Um, and feel free to also put them in the Q&A. Susan, do you wanna, wanna field a question? Sure, I will um, uh, put one out there. Um, we have a question uh, from an anonymous attendee. What potential difficulties or roadblocks do you see in your town's walk, bike, roll, master plan implementation? 
and how may these difficulties be overcome to guarantee the accomplishment of the plan's goals? All right, well, I'll take, I'll take a first crack at it and then Susan, maybe you have some thoughts to offer as well. Um, we were gonna have a whole slide on what we were calling the, the pitfalls of, of walk bike master plans. Um, I think the, the biggest thing that I have seen in communities is plans sitting on shelves and, and not being acted on. And, uh, you know, uh, what a town does is really the result of competing priorities. And so as a local advocate, you know, once your town's walk bike role master plan is, is adopted, um, you know, it is super important to not just sort of think that the work is done. Um, that's that's really when a lot more advocacy starts because now you have this whole list of projects to advocate for. But just because the walk bike role master plan has been adopted uh, does not at all mean that everything in it is going to automatically get done. Um, it doesn't even necessarily mean that uh, everything in it is supported by your community. All of those individual projects are still going to require advocacy. Um, so to me, that is that is the primary challenge and roadblock that I see with most walk bike little master plan implementation wise. Um, Susan, I wonder if you have additional thoughts. Yeah, I think I, I mean, I think just taking that a little bit further, I think what it's not uncommon, you know, because there's a lot of turnover, right, in town staff and um, who's sitting on our walk bike committees. Um, sometimes that information isn't transferred to sort of the next group coming in to do this work. And I think sometimes it's easy to kind of forget about the plan. And uh, so I guess I would urge walk by committees, um, whether you're formally established by your town or your uh, a local group of residents who've gotten together to do this kind of work to really make sure that you go in and you know whether or not or what kind of plans exist in your town and you pick those up and you go through them. And, um, you know, that idea of, knowing what the, the projects are and putting that into a spreadsheet and then starting to work from that, I think is a, a great way for groups to figure out their work plan. So a lot of groups, I think, struggle sometimes to figure out exactly what they should be working on. And that would be a first place that they should go. Um, so that again, it doesn't, those plans don't just get forgotten. So let's see, there's a question here. Is there a simple example of, of simple, less costly master bike plans? I thought you did say initially that you could do something basic and not spend $50,000. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So uh, we, we talked through uh, a handful of options that uh, are not a full walk bike master plan. Um, those could include, you know, doing a simple community survey where you sort of identify just from, from getting survey responses, where people want to see improvements, what the barriers are, uh, doing a walk audit is a more targeted, uh, form of planning where you sort of look at a, a specific street or a couple blocks and identify the problems. Um, you then need to sort of figure out how to address those, which is typically not covered in the audit itself. Um, and then there are what are called walk bike action plans. Uh, which are sort of lighter, faster walk bike master plans with less detail, less engagement, but they can give you some projects to think about advancing. Um, it all sort of depends on what your what where your community is, uh, what your street network looks like, uh, and what your aspirations are in terms of what's going to be uh, appropriate and effective for you. But there are definitely less expensive options. Um, and Bevan, I don't know if maybe you came in late. There there were a bunch of slides on that. Um, and we will be sending the recording out if people want to review it. And I think also, you know, another uh, thing to think about is um, maybe get some copies of different walk bike plans from communities that are similar to the one that you live in, or even some that are sort of really fully developed and that really high quality walk bike master plan. And then uh, and maybe some others that are less developed and sort of understand the range of how these can be put together and uh, and might be they start tackling some of those sections um, piece by piece over time so that um, you're kind of pulling it together in a less expensive way over time. So that's just another option to think about. So yeah, another and, question. And it's, 
just going to add, if, if you're in Vermont, feel free to reach out to us and uh, we can absolutely provide examples of plants from different communities of different scales from, you know, Bristol or Richmond uh, or East Hardwick all the way up to Burlington. Um, so let's see, we have a question about snow removal on our paths. Um, a little off topic, but the question is, how does Burlington keep the paths open when it snows? When do they get plowed? I'm in Fairbanks, Fairbanks Alaska, and snow removal is a real problem. Yeah, Jim, I feel your pain. Snow removal is a big problem here, too. Um, so the, the Burlington Greenway is uh, maintained by the Department of Parks and Recreation here, so they're responsible for plowing it. Uh, they do use uh, trucks to plow out. I believe they just use a pickup truck with a with a smaller blade. Um, actually, excuse me. Sometimes they use, I think, a sidewalk. Um, they they sort of plow half of it so that half of it is open to skiing. Um, and then the the bike lanes in town uh, typically get cleared by uh, just the the plow trucks, and then oftentimes the sidewalk plow will will follow behind it later on to clear anything that's left over. Um, but it is definitely a challenge. Uh, you know, you wind up with snow getting pushed back into the bike lane when people have their private plow companies come and do their driveways. Um, you still wind up with quite a bit of melt in the bike lane. So, you know, I think for places with snow, uh, one of the one of the long term solutions is elevating the bike infrastructure from the street so that you can actually have good drainage and not have the bike infrastructure, you know puddle of snow melt or ice. Um, and then also having it away from the street, you know, on a shared use path, something like that. Um, but it is it is definitely a challenge and um, a long-term thing that we're going to have to contend with here in Vermont. I will say, at least for us here in Vermont, one of the side, one of the benefits of climate change is that our dry riding season seems to be getting like a week or two longer every year. Um, so at least we've got that going for us. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, we have another question here um, asking about what measures or incentives could local authorities implement to encourage businesses and public spaces uh, in a community provide better bike parking options for residents? Yeah, so uh, the most effective measure uh, to implement is a bike parking regulation, uh, which works similar to a car parking regulation as part of the municipality's development ordinance. So it basically says, this is how much uh, short-term and how much long-term bike parking you need to build uh, based on any given scale and use. So if you're building 20 units, maybe you need to build you know, one biking, bike parking space per unit, something like that, bike parking space per unit. Um, and then that applies, you know, you apply that to all the different uses with specific, um, specific values based on the scale and the type of use. Um, and then you also want to define, you know, what type of racks are conforming. Uh, we do have a model bike parking ordinance uh, that we can provide a link to in our, in the chat here. Um, and that, that is the best tool that a municipality has to ensure that development in the future and redevelopment uh, comes with good bike parking. In terms of um, in terms of shorter term solutions, um, you know, it is hard for a municipality to, to they they can't really compel uh, businesses or private property owners generally to build new bike parking. But there are lots of ways to repurpose parking spaces on a street. Um, you know, and municipalities have a number of ways to raise money for something like bike parking. You know, one idea would be to use uh, car parking meter fees to pay for bike parking improvements. Um, so there are lots of options there. I'm just putting that link in the chat. Yeah, and um, we will also send out um, we'll send out a resource document as well. Uh, probably on on Monday or Tuesday, you'll get a document with a link to the recording as well as uh, the bike parking ordinance, all the future webinars we have coming up, all that good stuff. So that's it for questions that I can see here. So if anybody else um, would like to make a comment or ask a question, uh, please feel free to raise your hand. 
Oh, we did have one from, from Gary Fox uh, asking, uh, he's looking for ways to fund walk bike plans. So, and, and yeah, Gary works down in, in Rockingham with our friends in Bellas Falls. And um, Gary, you know, there, there are a handful of different funding options uh, from the state. The uh, municipal planning grant is one. Uh, the bike and pedestrian program grant, I believe the transportation alternatives grant can be used for planning activities. Um, so there are lots of options. We will go into all of that in more detail in our February webinar. Um, and we can also provide some information on that in the resource document. All right, well, I think, I think we got to everything and uh, folks definitely don't hesitate to reach out um, if, if there are any additional questions we can answer, local motion is here uh, for folks here in Vermont as a resource. We provide technical assistance, advocacy support. Uh, we are working at the state house to improve policy and legislation for walking, biking, and rolling. Um, so definitely get in touch if there's anything we can help with. Definitely keep an eye out for uh, that resource document early next week. And thank you all so much for coming and hope to see you next time.